We'll discuss chapters 14 and 15 of Chamber of Secrets on today's episode of MuggleCast, but first, a message from our sponsor. Hiring for your business can feel harder than finding the hidden creature under Hogwarts, but now I actually look forward to hiring. Why? Because I use Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. I love Indeed's Instant Match feature. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. That means you can keep moving along in the hiring process as soon as you post. There's no waiting around to see who applies, and that is a big time saver. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash MuggleCast to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly joyride through the Forbidden Forest in a Fort Anglia being chased by hungry spiders. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. And we are joined by one of our listeners this week, a Slug Club supporter herself, Kimberly. Hi, Kimberly. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. Kimberly, let's get your fandom ID. So my favorite book is Order of the Phoenix because it has my favorite character in it. My favorite character is Dolores Umbridge. (laughs) Scandalous. I know. Uh, My favorite movie is Sorcerer's Stone. It, you know, starts the magic. And my house is Slytherin. And my, my, my Patronus, I'm pretty sure, is a cat, although I don't know that that's actually related to Umbridge or not. Favorite creature? I actually reread Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them last night, being like, I don't have a favorite creature. Probably a <laughs> Nizel. Okay, yeah, we thought we'd ask for your favorite creature since we meet Aragog in the chapters we're discussing today. But let's hear about why Umbridge is your favorite character. That is unexpected to hear. I love that she has no redeeming qualities. Mm. She's the perfect villain. Like Voldemort, you get this very um, like intense backstory from like his birth and like his parents and why he's evil. Umbridge is just evil. <laughs> like there's there's no reason. And we all don't know a Voldemort in our lives. We all know Umbridges. It is very easy to be an Umbridge. You have to choose not to be. You have to choose to be better. Wow. That is a great point. <laughs> also, I, I play D&D, and I, f- I feel like she's the perfect lawful evil character. So. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, my gosh. Let's start a campaign together, Kimberly. <laughs> well, welcome to the show, Kimberly. It's great to have you here. Thank you for your support on Patreon. And you told me when we were getting ready for your appearance that every year you write Harry Potter themed Valentines, right? I do. Yeah, it started in 2013. Um, I just posted one in 2013 as a joke and I enjoyed it. And so since then, since 2014, um, for the first 14 days in February, February 1st through 14, I post a different one each day. Um, I'm a librarian, so I keep track every year in a Google Doc because I like to categorize things. And um, yeah, I have an entire list. We thought with Valentine's Day coming up, why don't you give us a few that you've written that I think these in this list, you sent me a big Google Doc with your entire archive. <laughs> uh, but I think these you haven't released yet. So we're getting kind of a sneak peek. No, actually. Oh, OK. I went through and picked ones that had to do with the chapters we were reading, actually. Oh, perfect. Great. OK. I said, are you sure you're not a basilisk? The moment I looked into your eyes, I froze. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Oh. Very topical. <laughs> um, I braved the forbidden forest to get to you. Oh. Um, and I'd follow the spiders if it meant finding you. <laughs> hey, I love that. Yeah. And then there's a couple, you know, like I love. I, I always start uh, the first few every year is 
I love you more than blah, blah, blah. So I love you more than Gilderoy Lockhart loves himself. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I, I have fun creating these every year. I think I, I have an ongoing Google Doc that I just, out all year I'm adding to it. So That's great. Well, you're a great writer too. Those are really good. I think mm-hmm. we're going to do more of these coming up in a bonus muscle cast say, installment. These giving me some inspiration here. <laughs> yeah. But they may not be rated G or PG or PG-13. And that's why they'll be behind the paywall. Well, let's get into our chapters this week, Micah. Let's begin with our seven word summary for Aragog. And Andrew, it's you yeah. and me, buddy, this week on All this right. chapter to start things off. I like the format that Eric introduced last week. Oh, man, we're going to stick with this. Two of us out there alone. At least alone. for two weeks in a row. Uh, we'll try it out. We'll we'll pair each other up and uh, see how it goes. So, Andrew. Also kind of appropriate for Valentine's, you know. Uh, c- couples. Yeah. Couples seven word summaries. Our one true pairing. <laughs> I'm getting <laughs> sufficiently words. warmed up for Valentine's this time, this year. People out there in a relationship or maybe with your uh, BFF, you know, doing the Galentine's Day, do some seven word summaries together. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Micah, here we go. All right, here we go. Uh, Spiders. 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 (laughs) Spiders. (laughs) Vroom. 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 That works. Like a good couple, we may have planned that in advance. <laughs> <laughs> spiders, so, spiders, 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 vroom, vroom, vroom. Yes. Okay. I mean, that is a good summary with seven words. I think words. that's pretty you outstanding. Deny yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's, yeah. I would give that an exceeds expectations. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank that you. was Micah's idea. Yeah, we, we you know what, since we're changing up the uh, the seven word summary so much and we're going with pairs now, I mean, you know, Andrew and I did a little prep work. Uh, so hopefully. Yeah, the, the pre planning, I'm not necessarily super happy about, but. Yeah. but, 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 <laughs> but play Micah, play Micah. Laura and I all have to. Yeah, I, I feel like if the if the goalpost shifted here, Eric and I should have been informed. Yeah. But you guys okay. are just mad that we thought of, about this in advance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have an entire chapter's worth of discussion to come up with it. Come up with want. two words to interchange. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And by the way, listeners might be thinking, why didn't we ask Kimberly? That's so rude. Kimberly wanted to opt out a seven word summary because it's a lot of pressure, which we understand and agree with. It's also the first time that's ever happened that I can recall. I don't th- I don't like the new seven word summary rules, you guys. This is just too much change. <laughs> I loved it so much last week. I was like, oh, you guys can just keep going with this new format. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, It's perfect. Great timing. How would you rate the seven word summary, though? I don't know that it's the best one that you guys oh, okay. have ever done. I appreciate the honesty, and I think yeah. you're right. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to Michael's poll in MuggleCast Patrons Facebook group. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not See the where best. That Not the worst. And actually, I, I had um, Chat GPT write this entire discussion for me uh, <laughs> since I uh, read the chapters last week. But all right, let's uh, let's start on the conversation about Aragog. And I want to jump right in to connect the threads because the mood at the start of this chapter is a very somber one. And pulling a quote from the chapter, it says, with Dumbledore gone, fear had spread as never before so that the sun warming the castle walls outside seemed to stop at the mullion windows. There was barely a face to be seen in the school that didn't look worried and tense, and any laughter that ran through the corridors sounded shrill and unnatural and was quickly stifled. And this reminded me so much of Half-Blood Prince after Dumbledore dies. The tone throughout the school is very similar to what we're experiencing now. Yeah, and I mean, for readers and Harry, it's the first time that their lead guy is out. Of course, Harry also knows and the professors have known that Dumbledore has been there for a very long time. So for this larger than life figure to be gone must be very shocking and and scary. If you also think of these students as like 
being aware that they're always teetering on a little bit of danger. Now the only like protector that's made them feel like, oh, it wouldn't be too bad. Dumbledore would never get it let get let it get uh, worse than this uh, is now gone. So I would feel very vulnerable all the time. Yeah. It is an interesting contrast to the end of Sorcerer's Stone, though, because at the end of that book, when Dumbledore leaves, the trio understands that's a big deal, but nobody else seems to be that bothered by it. So this is the first time that everybody gets to experience the feeling that the trio had at the end of Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah, that, that's a really great point. And I think, too, just the fact that the students have been attacked multiple times up until this point. And now, as was mentioned, you're removing the only person that you probably feel comfortable with handling the situation. It's like there's been another attack uh, and, and Dumbledore might as well be petrified up in the hospital wing at this point. Right. Too. Right. And this was the book. This is the year where he really has taken a step back and not done anything to fix anything. So the fact that he's gone is like, I don't know that it's a huge loss, but it feels like a huge loss. Right. Well, there's one person, however, who is very happy with how things have played out, and that is Draco. Uh, and I thought that his behavior, though, you know, talking about how his father finally got him out. Uh, it's an example of how minus there being a real authority figure present that prejudice thrives, right? So it's not just his comments about Dumbledore. It's also his comments about Hermione and about mudbloods and like this rhetoric is allowed to be put out there into the school and not be kept in check because you don't have somebody like Dumbledore in power anymore. It's also an interesting connecting the threads moment to Half-Blood Prince where Draco is getting to kind of, you know, reap the rewards for this ideology that he has professed to have all these years. In Chamber of Secrets, he is so confident in his, you know, pro Slytherin, pure blood mania, pro Dark Lord uh, sentiments. And then in book six, he gets a taste of what that's really like. And he does a complete 180 honestly. So Harry and Ron make the decision to follow the spiders and they use the invisibility cloak to at least get out of the castle. But talking about how Hogwarts is a security nightmare, I want to know how even is this possible with everything that's going on, right? There are professors posted at every turn. There are sentries, but somehow, some way, these two are able to get out of the front door <laughs> and they talk about how, you know, they got to make sure it doesn't creak. I don't know if they use some WD-40 on it or what. Mm. But, you know, like these, I'm imagining these big wooden doors are being opened up and nobody is paying attention to this. Like, how is that possible? They're definitely that creaky. I agree with you. <laughs> very creaky. Yeah, very heavy. Nobody would not hear it unless they have a wizarding WD-40. I don't know. I mean, it's like, do you put a spell on the front doors of Hogwarts saying nobody could go in and out? Because there's bound to be that one student who's like coming late from Herbology or running down late, or there's a visitor, another official is coming to take another teacher away. Like, there's just going to be so many uh, variables that I feel like a school's front door, even... Um, Hogwarts, even under these uncertain times, it would be more trouble than it's worth to like set an alarm on them. Instead, they're relying on the structure of prefects and head boy and head girl to like keep people in their dormitories after hours instead of just blanket, like locking the door for spell. I just find it curious that we know there are professors patrolling the corridors at night to keep watch and nobody hears these big creaky doors open. And furthermore, why don't they have somebody staffed to watch the entrance to the school? Yeah. Well, when Hogwarts Legacy comes out in a week or two, we'll be able to find out if those big front doors are creaky or not. I assume you can mm. walk through them. I do like the idea of maybe not like a professor being guarding the front doors, but a statue or two would probably 
do the job. That's true. Whereas I would find it unlikely they'd hire a person just to sit at stand at the door. Uh, they have magic and the type <laughs> yeah. of transfiguration we've seen. Like they have an unlimited workforce. Think of all those uh, nights at the end of the um, at Deathly Hallows, the movie where <laughs> just McGonagall just protect our school. You know, just like totally have one of those guys. You would not go to Hagrid's hut if one of those guys was guarding the door. Yeah, with their yeah. giant weapons. Invisibility cloak or not, I would assume they have special abilities to detect. I do also wonder, and because at this point we've identified so many security nightmares, I I try (laughs) now to defend Dumbledore and the school. I wonder if they avoid putting visible security at the front door to calm the nerves of the students. Because if there's too much security, it's just going to stress the students out further. Even the staff, though, are worried about the security. Like, they block off the uh, the hospital wing. They won't let anyone visit them um, because there's every chance the attacker might come back to finish them off. They, they apparently don't have any way to secure the hospital wing from more attacks. Yeah, I feel like even the staff are feeling the loss of Dumbledore very acutely for implementing these measures show that, like, you're like you're exactly like you're saying, Kimberly, they can't even defend. Uh, the hospital wing. Um, But also about that, it makes me believe that somebody has an inkling that the attacker, that the petrification of these people wasn't the end goal, which we know is true from having finished the book, that somebody suspects these people are still in danger, which I find to be very interesting. Who tipped them off? Who knew that petrification wasn't the goal? That, that in fact, it was murder. Um, like, was that Dumbledore's? Like, again, how much did Dumbledore know before he left uh, the school about what the motivations were and who the attacker was? Because he didn't seem to share any of that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. did he finally come clean <laughs> about knowing <laughs> yeah. more than he was letting on to? If that's the concern, why weren't they moved to St. Mungo's then? Great question. Or the trap door underneath the school from year one. I mean, that's a safe place. Uh, <laughs> I just personally believe that the front door is priority number one. So <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's an easy, that's low-hanging fruit You there. could put think- Peeves there. You could put a ghost there. It, there are options that are available, going back to what Andrew was talking about earlier. So I think we've established that. Harry and Ron are going to get to where they need to get to no matter what. But on that note, they do make their way down to Hagrid's hut. They decide that it'd be a great idea to take Fang uh, along with them. Now, Fang is like going nuts too inside of Hagrid's hut. So he's making a ton of noise, which nobody hears, presumably, or they just assume, oh, the dog is barking again. Um, but there's activity at Hagrid's hut is my point. And given how much attention, obviously Hagrid has gotten and they've Mm. taken him off to Azkaban, they don't have anybody stationed at Hagrid's hut either. They don't have anybody stationed outside of the forest. It just seems a little suspect. I feel like somebody should be letting Fang out at least because I, maybe the reason he's going nuts is because nobody's let him go to the bathroom. Which he does in this chapter. I think he's one of the only characters in the (laughs) Harry Potter series that ever goes to the bathroom. Oh, wow. (laughs) I must read over that sentence. Start the bathroom count. Rats one and it's an animal. Oh, if we want to connect the threads, Dumbledore goes to the bathroom and uh, he mentions it. The beginning of Half-Blood Prince. When he discovers the oh well that but also he talks about uh chamber pots. The room of chamber pots when he discovers the room I, of requirements I, I, wow. I was talking about in uh slughorn's hideaway he goes to the yeah, bathroom yeah yeah well hermione also mentions how it's difficult with moaning myrtle in her bathroom to use the bathroom but fang actually lists his leg those are the words that are written on the page so you know what wow. yeah good okay. doggy good doggy but i agree with you i i think that um somebody should have been taking care of fang that that's animal cruelty we've talked a lot I mean, about hedwig but poor fang i know well like even that that that's like hagrid's taking away request which is a very small request you should absolutely be taking care of his dog if you're going to wrongfully imprison this guy at least put somebody on it like Grubbly plank could do it, it, it you, know, you don't even need a care magical creature specialist just let the damn dog out Yes. Do we think that it was smart for Harry and Ron to go into the forest by themselves, though? I know they have Fang with them, uh, but they have absolutely no clue where the spiders are going to lead them. 
And not to mention the last time Harry tried out this experiment, he ran into Voldemort. (laughs) (laughs) There's something calming about entering a forest, right? Maybe that's what they were thinking. They were just drawn to the the magic of of a forest and they weren't intimidated by it. And I mean, how many times could they possibly run into an evil creature in the forest, even though they've been told to uh, not enter it? At any cost. I mean, doesn't Ron ask, aren't there werewolves in the forest? (laughs) And Harry just doesn't answer him. He's just like, "Mm -hmm." we've avoided trouble before. After Voldemort, (laughs) everything's easy. It's all downhill from here. Well, to that line, I just to your point, Laura, we forget that Ron wasn't with them in Sorcerer's Stone. That's a movieism, much like Hermione isn't with them this time around. So he has never been to the forest. He doesn't know what to expect. Mm. Well, it just reminds me of Filch's line again from the movies. Ah, it's much more worse than werewolves in that forest, guys. <laughs> like, yeah, if there's worse than if werewolves are like as good as it gets in the forest. No, I agree. I, I think for me, the brilliance of them going alone, well, asterisk with Fang uh, into the forest this time is they're trusting Hagrid. And this is a mistake they're not going to make again. Uh, because they assume that if their friend Hagrid was like, here's how to find out some stuff, uh, just follow the spiders. If Hagrid recommends it, it has to be at least safe enough to to them. And they assume that Hagrid assumes that when he suggests it, he would not willingly put them in trouble, but Hagrid has a very big blind spot when it comes to his monsters, as we later learn. So I think that that's really, they're just, they feel safe going into the forest because it's Hagrid. That That's a really good point. Do. Yeah, I agree with that. They just trust their buddy. Yeah. And it's not even the first time this happens in the series. I mean, think about Order of the Phoenix, where Harry and Hermione wrongly assume that because of their association with Hagrid and because they're, you know, children, although they are nearing adulthood, that they would be safe. And the centaurs were like, actually, no. Well, Harry forgets that he's been <laughs> fated to die and the centaurs are ne- never going to interfere with his fate. So, <laughs> Right. Except good old friends. Well, Eric, you mentioned that there are dangerous creatures in the Forbidden Forest, including a wild Fort Anglia, uh, which <laughs> Harry the and most Ron... dangerous creature of them all. Yes. That cracks me up because Ron says the Forbidden Forest has turned the Fort Anglia wild. That's a quote. What does that mean? I'm I'm picturing it starting campfires, hunting for food, meaning gasoline, I suppose, smearing paint on its face, like looking like war torn, bathing in the Black Lake. What does it mean? (laughs) Fort Anglia has gone wild. It's gone rogue. (laughs) Yeah, all of exactly that. (laughs) That's pretty cool. I'd like a spinoff series documenting all of that. Yeah. But yeah, the Fort Anglia does save the day for them. It does. But they, they meet it first before they encounter Aragog, again, different from the films. And I was wondering, though, you know, Dumbledore is nowhere to be seen. Do we think he had anything to do with the Fort Anglia showing up to assist Harry and Ron? I like the idea that Dumbledore is sort of just out of shot, kind of like, Snape in the silver dose scene where it's just kind of like, I'm going to help you, but you're not going to know that I helped you because I like to believe Dumbledore does literally anything in this book worthwhile. Um, but I think that that might take away the agency of the <laughs> this enchanted car. Yeah. Don't that insult the car. I, well, you know, it's like <laughs> Arthur Weasley who has been prohibited from like searching for the car and getting it back because it's questionably legal. Um, would be thrilled to know that the car nevertheless has like this this personality. Just to me, it's a, it talks about how we all personify our car. Like how many of us have named our car yep. in, or a car in the past? Yep. And it's just this beautiful thing where the car has been enchanted and can kind of show some personality back. It's it's a real fun kind of moment. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I imagined anyone directing the car if it turned wild i'm imagining more lord of the flies and um (laughs) just chaos so uh the anglia killed all the other cars that were in the forest and uh yeah (laughs) held a tribunal and declared itself the leader must be a weasley who's listening live said built ford tough (laughs) (laughs) that one wins the day but 
I guess what I was getting at is the whole line from, I think it was the previous chapter, help will always be given at Hogwarts to those who need it, or is that- Ask for it. I know he changes it in Deathly Hallows, but my point is we often focus solely on what happens in the chamber as Dumbledore providing the help that Harry needs, but I think there could be some moments along the way that maybe we could point to, like this one, where Dumbledore is assisting as well, but we just never find out about it. Yeah, possible. So we meet Aragog. So after Harry and Ron find the Fort Anglia, some spiders come and they take them away to Aragog's lair. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to do a name origin segment. Wow. I feel very refreshed after that. That's honestly. that's really soul cleansing. I feel like I just finished uh, like a mindfulness session. So Aragog, Era comes from Arachnid, which is the class that spiders belong to. And Gog or Magog are, are biblical names. So it's noted here, possibly derived from the Greek word agog, meaning leader, from which the modern English demagogue is an iteration. So basically all that adds up to is Aragog literally means leader of the spiders. Superb. So an appropriate name for Hagrid's best bud. I love how uh, forthcoming Aragog is with information. Obviously, Harry and Ron have cause to be terrified. There's quite a bit of clicking going on around them, uh, and it's all very menacing. But <laughs> like Aragog is... It's it's a perfect chapter to me because the they they achieve what they um, set out to do, but it also nearly kills them. So it's just very exciting yeah. how Aragog tells them everything they want to know, and he's like, "Okay, time to eat you." And then they go, well, like, he, what? Wait, he gives what? them as much information as they could possibly want uh, about himself and about the chamber, and we know that uh, Aragog came to Hagrid in the pocket of a traveler. And uh, there's been much speculation on this show over the years, as I'm sure in the larger wizarding fan community, that that traveler was Newt's commander. I think we need to start just declaring things canon. Uh, Grand yeah. years. Again, I've referenced this before, but just like the Michael Scott, I declare bankruptcy. <laughs> I declare canon! With a big echo and thunderous roar. We got to save that as a, as a new sound effect we have. I declare cannon. There, it's done. I totally, su- I totally support that. I totally support. <laughs> Will that. you actually do it? it? Because I think last week or two weeks ago, you said no more sound effects. <laughs> this one's no really inspiring me. No, I've made so many. Somebody else do it. I will do it. Send okay. me the clip of you doing that. Great. And I will do the thunder on the Perfect. mountain. Yes. The, okay. Thunder. Yeah. yeah. Little echo. You got it. You got it. Got Thank it. you. No, I feel like we're never going to get another Fantastic Beast movie. Sorry if that's uh, fatalist or defeatist. But uh, I, I otherwise, I think we very clearly would have seen that happen. Although now I'm second guessing myself because Kimberly, I think you put in a detraction here. I'm yeah. unexpectedly shocked. I don't. Well, so a MuggleNet article that I read a couple of years ago convinced me that it wouldn't be Newt because Newt is a lot more responsible with his with his beast and wouldn't have just been handing out creatures and eggs that were rated XXXXX to random students, uh, third years. Interesting. Willy, willy nilly. <laughs> That's that's a fair take. The word, the phrase that gets it for me, uh, which has not been stated yet, is invasive species. So Newt, I think, really would be conscious of what it would mean if the Forbidden Forest were to be taken over, say, by like a family of these things. Um, They have their own nook. It seems like the forest is big enough for them and the centaurs and everything else horrible that's in the forest. Well, horrible is subjective. But yeah, it makes me question it for sure. Sorry, Andrew, didn't mean to detract from your new canon. Oh, no, it's okay. I mean, I declared it canon, so it is now canon, no matter what <laughs> MuggleNet says in their editorial. If it wasn't Newt, who would it be? I mean, how does a 12-year-old, how does a second-year student who can't even go to Hogsmeade yet uh, come by an egg from a traveler's pocket? Who was visiting a teacher at school and was just like, here, kid? It had to have been Newt. So yeah, I mean, here's a question. Who gave Hagrid the dragon's egg? in Sorcerer's Stone. And is it possible that Tom Riddle was this passing traveler 
And he was planting the seeds to be able to potentially frame somebody in the event that people at Hogwarts started getting suspicious. I like that. But I like Newt. Yeah, it just (laughs) fits so nicely. Laura, I like Laura's uh, theory, though. Definitely. So Yeah, it's my crackpot theory. (laughs) We can call it a crackpot theory. It is, but um, I stand by it. Well, in the Valentine's Day spirit, we are just uh, 10 days away, and uh, we know that Hagrid cares so much for these creatures, so much that he even brought Aragog a wife. And they were, from what we read, very busy over the years populating the Forbidden Forest. (laughs) I think this just speaks to how much Hagrid does really care about the creatures that he... um, you know, comes into, I don't want to say he owns them, but like they mean something to him beyond just, you know, a pet. Yeah. I mean, Aragog speaks about it. Aragog clearly has affection as much as this creature is capable of such a thing. The way that Aragog talks about Hagrid is very, very like he says that it's because of Hagrid's care and Hagrid's love that he was able to thrive and they're able to have this colony that's about to eat Harry and Ron. So it's it's very special to actually see um, this creature that wouldn't normally, you know, would, or would normally be driven by instinct solely uh, to, to afford a moment of gratitude or thanks for this half giant, half human guy that was basically his parent. Yeah, and Aragog's wife's name is Mosog. Uh, and if you look up what that means, uh, it is a female of utmost ugliness who has oh. little or no respect <laughs> for her outward appearance. Oh, yeah. The the kindest definition I could find is a drabish woman, but I think it's meant to be like, okay, Aragog is just this huge hideous creature that um, Hagrid named and we're going to give an equally hideous name for his wife. Like, I'm sure they're nice people, but (laughs) the name is not... I'm sure she's great. Yeah. Uh, Uh, They they work well together. Uh, But moving on, uh, we get to one of the most important parts of the conversation, which is that Aragog confirms Hagrid was not the one who opened the Chamber of Secrets. And I just think Aragog's story overall shows how he and his family have been viewed with this prejudice. They're forced to retreat to the forest. They have to live in fear of both the monster that lives in the castle, the basilisk, and persecution for a crime that Hagrid did not commit. Uh, so there, there's a lot of underlying themes there. Um, and, and Hagrid is very much in the same boat as Aragog, right? He is forced to deal with prejudice. He is arrested for a crime he doesn't uh, he's not responsible for, and you know he he kind of has this taboo about him. So it ties into the larger themes I think that we see uh, throughout Chamber of Secrets and even in Half Blood Prince. I didn't necessarily connect uh, how Hagrid is framed by Voldemort as being the same as how Aragog is framed, basically by the actions of Voldemort by the Basilisk. That actually Haragog and uh, Har- Haragog. <laughs> Hagrid and Aragog are very similar as people. They're both too big to be allowed. They're both uh, suspected to be more violent than they are. Although asterisk Aragog actually is every bit as violent as everyone thinks he did. He just didn't open the chamber. Um, so yeah, I I find a, an interesting set of connections between Hagrid and Aragog uh, as characters. I just think it's interesting that you invented a new ship, Haragog. Aragog. Aragog. <laughs> Aragog. <laughs> Yeah, all right, I ship it. I mean, if Aragog's hungry, he's like going to eat Harry. It's cool. <laughs> That's love. Well, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm sure there's a fan fiction out there. Oh, 100%. Uh, so. <laughs> Guaranteed. But I, I do think it's it's an interesting to look at the fact that Aragog is, is a sentient creature and he clearly has feelings, but at the same time, he's also a beast and there are these kind of natural tendencies that he has. And we see that come out when he wants his family to be provided for in, in eating Harry and Ron. So it just shows you the, you know, and we meet a number of creatures, I think, like that throughout the series. Yeah, I mean, he calls Harry and Ron after this pleasant conversation, he calls them fresh meat. It's like, ouch, 
that hurts. <laughs> like, hello, I'm more than just my body, okay? <laughs> but Aragog can't be tamed. So the biggest piece of information that Aragog gives to Harry and Ron is that the girl who was killed 50 years ago died in a bathroom. And Harry and Ron are not really in the position right now to connect the dots. I think they're a little bit running on adrenaline and and freak the hell out that they're about to become Aragog's dinner. Um, so, but this is a big piece of information. This is probably one of the last pieces of the puzzle that needs to come together for them to start figuring out everything that happened uh, 50 years ago with the Chamber of Secrets. Bathroom 50 years ago. If only somebody will have a note with the word pipes on it. I think this thing will really well, get cracked together. wide you know open. Funny you should say that because that might be happening in the next chapter. Oh, perfect. So to kind of wrap up this chapter, I wanted to connect the Basilisk to Voldemort. Um, Aragog says that the spiders do not speak of this creature. And I thought that this really shows how fear can be spread simply based on reputation and rumor. And that fear can grow over time to the point where one's name becomes synonymous with fear. And we see this literally with Voldemort throughout the Harry Potter series. So it's only natural that his creature would have the same kind of reputation amongst the spiders. Was this just in the movie or was this in the book too? Fear of a name increases fear of the thing itself. Was it's that, in the books. It is yeah, in, different the books. It's in the books. Okay. It's in the movies too. Yeah. I think Hermione says it, but I think it's a Dumbledore line, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. In the books. Yeah. Yeah. Another example of Hermione being given <laughs> brilliant lines from other characters, even though she doesn't need them because she's already a brilliant character. Sorry. Yeah. I always <laughs> think about that line. Gonna get off my soapbox really irritates no, me. No, it's fine. <laughs> Before we get to odds and ends, I just wanted to get a sense from everybody. We know that um, Ron is afraid of spiders. We know Rupert Grint, who played Ron, is afraid of spiders. Are we all afraid of spiders too? Like, what? What's our? I'm not afraid. On... I'll get creeped out if I see one that's particularly large. They're good for the environment. I like spiders. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> if I find one, I will do my very best to safely capture it and then take it, it outside. outside to release it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The larger they are, the more uh, unnaturally and instinctually terrified I get. Um, <laughs> the more components I can see with my naked eye, I just get very, very, very freaked out. But uh, to the argument of the environment, I do support their existence, but I hope they do it away from me. I support <laughs> their existence. Just don't exist near me. Yeah, Laura, you can start coming <laughs> and uh, picking up the spiders at Eric and Mai's places and, okay. and taking them back with you. Okay. Yeah, we'll yeah. hang out. It'll be great. Yeah, they're not going to bug you. Kimberly, what about you? I'm, I am I don't love them at all. And I would... I, I also don't like squishing things, so I try to fling stuff outside as much as possible. <laughs> um, okay. But I, I actually, um, so I did the Fantastic Beasts experience in New York um, a couple weeks ago, and I just thought it was very interesting. The if you're afraid of spiders, go this way. <laughs> like they were very determined to make you aware that there was going to be large spiders in front of you. Really? Well, I think the spiders were uh, what resulted in movie two being rated what PG for quote terrifying sequences or something like that. Oh, wow. I do the same thing as Laura. I, you know, I try and Release capture them, them into and the wild side. Or I just. If they're too small, I don't even bother with them. I just let them yeah. be. You let them be. If there's one in your bedroom and you, like you see it above yeah. you while you sleep. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I guess stronger than all Laura of us. Laura said they're good for the environment. They are. Yeah, but and they, honestly, they catch other things that you don't want in your bedroom. The, that's the thing is like if you have a spider in your house, it has probably taken care of some pests that you would not want to be there otherwise. So mm -hmm. right. Right. Leave them be. But uh, I agree with Kimberly, though, uh, about the Forbidden Forest experience with the spiders coming down. That was it was cool. But yes, they do have a sign that says if you're afraid, you might not want to do <laughs> this funny. part of the uh, tour. That's funny. So some odds and ends from this chapter. Of course, it's important to connect the threads just on Aragog alone uh, to Half-Blood Prince because his death plays a major role. Uh, in Harry finding out more or really finding the key to everything. Um, in Slughorn's memory. 
Uh, but at the beginning of the chapter, Draco jokes about Snape becoming headmaster and how he is sure Snape would have a Lucius Malfoy's full support. And we know in Half-Blood Prince, after Dumbledore's death, Snape becomes headmaster. So I thought that was funny. That's very fun. We also see the Hufflepuffs. Uh, Ernie and Hannah finally turn the corner and uh, warm back up to Harry with Ernie noting that there's no way that Harry would ever attack Hermione. So it took, you know, Hermione being attacked for Ernie to wake up <laughs> to what was going on. Yeah, better late than never, guys. Yeah, Seriously, that's where I have fall. To, you have to do better next time fellow puffs and then these last two i we talked about fang doing his business in the forbidden forest but then there's a really kind of odd moment for percy uh and percy notes that um Ginny walked in on him while he was doing something and you know it's it's a little ambiguous and and percy you know i i think it was him and penelope which we later learned but like it's really suggestive, I'll be honest with you. I look at I don't have the exact quote here. Yeah. I, I look at this moment and I say props to Ginny for really trying to tell Ron and Harry what was going on. Um, she's really trying to communicate and can't get the words out. And as soon as she is like the Percy comes and ruins everything, and it's just like, oh, that was just no, she saw a thing. I, I would hope she wouldn't tell anybody that I was doing this, but uh just like, oh, it's a complete misdirect. And it's not until later when we find that Ginny has been taken that anyone would even think that, uh, and I think Ron connects it, that she was trying to tell them something Yeah, uh, of great importance. It, it's actually a really important moment that we didn't talk about in this chapter is, is Ginny coming up to them and, and trying to come clean about yeah, everything that's going on. My girl. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get to our next chapter today, it's time for a word from the people who make my evenings fun and delicious. Hello, fresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Looking for an easy way to eat well and save money? Cut back on expensive takeout and delivery and get started with HelloFresh. You'll love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right in your own kitchen. No matter your lifestyle or meal preferences, HelloFresh has recipes sure to please everyone at your table. From fit and wholesome to veggie or family-friendly, you'll always find something even the pickiest eaters will enjoy. The meals come organized and ready to put in your fridge until you're ready to cook. Then you follow the simple instructions on the included recipe card. The best way I can review HelloFresh is by telling you that we will repeatedly visit the same meals we get from HelloFresh over and over again because they are so, so good. And we keep thinking about them days after. When we have people over or family visiting, we'll make one of the meals, too, to impress them with our cooking skills. We'll get a oh, wow reaction out of them and then admit we didn't dream up the recipe ourselves, but we were still good cooks. You definitely want to try this out. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Muggle65 and use code Muggle65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Muggle65 and use code Muggle65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Such a great deal, especially with the cost of food right now. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. I have HelloFresh to thank for knowing how to... Uh, do many of the cooking essentials now. Yeah, they open your um, world up, don't they? They really do. I'll send you some of my favorite recipes. We'll trade. Oh, that'll be great. <laughs> well, it's time for chapter 16, and Eric and Laura, you two are now going to have a little right. cute trade-off. Let's see what they have come up with. It's going to be hard to compete with your pre-planned yeah. uh, <laughs> spider, 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 spiders, vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> All right. But we'll give it a go. Gilderoy is revealed to have no integrity. <laughs> yeah. Love it. I like it, especially because we didn't cheat. Yeah. Wow. We didn't cheat. Wow. Look what you did, Micah. You really upset <laughs> Eric and Laura. Well, you didn't have to reveal that we planned it in advance, so it's your <laughs> fault as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, come on. How could we They're not? They're infighting. Have? They're infighting. We got to stop. I know. We it's could Valentine's go back and do it Day, again. Y'all. No, it's done. No, no, it's no. locked in. 
I truly think it's one of the best seven word summaries that ever happened. I think so, I think too. so too. I'm just yeah. teasing you. Okay. Yeah. But we have finally arrived at the Eric. Is this the is this the titular chapter? How does what's the what's the appropriate word? That would be right. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, titular is is correct, but there's there's probably one or two uh, eponymous. Maybe might be one. Mm. I have to think about it. There's other words for it too. But yeah. Okay. The title All track. Right. Yes, it is the Chamber of Secrets. So we have arrived. Finally, it only took 16 chapters to get here, but it's actually going to take 17 to get into the chamber itself. Uh, but uh, One thing to mention from the end of the last chapter is that Harry and Ron finally put two and two together and figure out that it was Moaning Myrtle who was killed uh, 50 years ago. And so they're going to set out uh, to try and uh, have a conversation with her. Do you guys remember when you first sort of discovered this or the, the when you first read the end of the last chapter? And it turns out that this crazy weirdo ghost that's kind of been hanging around in the book comes up every once in a while. You're like, ah, she doesn't really have a purpose. Turns out to be the center of the entire plot. Yeah, it's been under our noses all along. I just love, I will never get old of this uh, narrative sort of trick or style of slowly working something in that is like deliberately off put to be, oh, that won't come back again and then have it come back again and be like, oh my God, it's totally cool. Right. We meet her at the death day party many chapters earlier as kind of a passing moment. On the night of the first attack. They actually, Ron doesn't say this when they figure it all out. But they absolutely figure out sort of how everyone was petrified and not killed. And they don't say it, but it's actually the trio's comments that Peeves overhears, then uh, attacks Myrtle with verbally, causing her to retreat to her toilet and cry so much so that the first floor corridor floods and Mrs. Norris sees the reflection of the basilisk through the water and therefore is not killed, but isn't in fact saved. But they don't take responsibility for the fact that <laughs> they caused and saved Mrs. Norris's attack. Mm. Yeah. Could we say that in a way they saved Mrs. Norris by bullying Myrtle behind her back? Inadvertently, yes, absolutely. Never thought of it that way. Poor Myrtle. This is so sad for her, both in life and in death. She is completely disregarded. And when people do pay attention to her, it's to talk about how annoying she is. The only if we're talking about characters with no redeeming qualities, some of Kimberly's favorites, I would say (laughs) that uh, Moaning Myrtle is a tragic character, but it is totally implied. And she relishes the fact that Olive Hornby got hers. So I feel like Myrtle, like, yes, we feel mostly bad for her and she seems mostly pathetic as a character. But when you find out that she totally probably haunted Olive Hornby and had to be stopped maybe by the government, say, from doing that. Um, I think that she's okay where she is in her toilet. <laughs> yeah, but I think Olive Hornby deserved at least some of that. Oh, definitely. Because she yeah. was crying in the bathroom because of Olive yeah. teasing her about her glasses. So Yeah, I wonder how long it went on for, though, because it's, it's a subject that M- Myrtle herself is still very gleeful about. Like, oh, Olive Hornby totally regretted making fun of it. It's like, wow. There were probably years of, you know, haunts. Well, how much does I, she have, really? How much does Myrtle have going on for her? She died when she was 12 uh, or 13 yeah. after being bullied mercilessly. And she's still bullied in the afterlife. So yeah. I feel bad for her. I did like what you said, though, Eric. Filch actually owes Peeves one then for Mrs. Norris. Oh, yeah. I mean, it'd be a lot better if Mrs. Norris were never petrified to begin with. But uh, Oh, of that's, course. That's on double. course. So one of the things that is looming over the students at the start of this chapter is their end of year exams. And I'm wondering, do, we know what happens, but I'm let's just assume that we don't know yet that the exams are going to be canceled. Do we think it's fair for students to have to take end of year exams given everything that's happened so far this year? I mean, I guess we could say that about any year that Harry is at Hogwarts, but... right. Well, I, I guess know, it's like, like the, if if they don't do the exams, why be studying right now at all? Like, and and w- if you canceled exams early, then the students probably wouldn't be paying attention in class because they would know they'd just be able to advance to their next year anyway. It comes down to why is the school still open with all yeah. these attacks? Yeah, so I, I think that's I, the I bigger agree with question. there. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it just raises the question, what are they doing here? What are they even doing here if not learning? And isn't the per- it sounds like an umbrage thing, though, doesn't it? To be like, and what is the purpose of school if not to learn and to take tests? Well, one person who would probably agree with you is Gilderoy Lockhart. And uh, he believes the culprit has been apprehended, right? So why do I need to be escorting you students to your classes? And um, this is when Harry sees an opportunity uh, to take advantage uh, of of a situation. And he actually plays into the fact that Gilderoy believes that Hagrid was the one responsible. And um, you know, I, I, Ron is almost shocked in that moment um, that he is willing to kind of give in, but then catches on. And we see that um, Harry and Ron are able to get away. They go actually to try to enter Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, but are caught by McGonagall. And Harry, again, quick in the moment, says, oh, we were sneaking off to visit Hermione. And he plays on McGonagall's heartstrings, the son of a bitch, you know, like he even like makes her tear up a little bit, I think. And, uh, but it just shows like in the moment, what a quick thinker Harry is, right? He does it back to back. He does it to Lockhart and then he does it to McGonagall and uh, they do get to go up uh, and see their best friend in the hospital wing. I love how consistent Lockhart is when they need to get in the restricted section. Hermione just takes care of it. A little bit of flattery will get you everywhere. And then when they need to go and break from the crowd, Harry's just like, I got this and just flatters Lockhart a little bit and a little bit. And it just totally works every time. He's super consistent at being the most worthless guardian protector teacher in Hogwarts history. It's what you got to do sometimes, everybody listening. That's how you can advance in life sometimes. You just got to suck up, maybe do a little fake it till you make it. Sweet talk. Sweet talk. Yeah. Can work wonders on people, especially the Lockhart types. And if all else fails, send them cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes that'll fail too. So you have to think of another plan. So Harry and Ron are in the hospital and uh, they find a piece of paper in Hermione's hand, which nobody else has found up until this point. Is that like slightly shady on like madame pomfrey or i i would think you would inspect the body a little bit but yeah maybe since she's like the fourth one they're just like okay it's like really well, if her, in there though yeah if her hands kind of curled up you might be like making a fist because you're so shocked to see the basilisk like that might be a natural reaction so i guess i could see why pomfrey would assume that's why her hand is curled up really it's on harry and ron for not noticing it sooner <laughs> reminds has been like that for a month they didn't look closer. The line that stuck out to me being a librarian was that it was a page torn from a library book. <laughs> you know, Hermione is pretty serious when she has to tear something. I mean, it can probably be mended, right? When she defaces school property. <laughs> yeah, it can be mended. It can absolutely can be mended. Probably. There's Reparo. There's um, any number oh, of okay. skulls. Bookulous Reparo. Yeah. That's true. It can be repaired Novelist with repair. magic. Yeah. <laughs> but please, take... out there in the world, do not tear pages from your library books. This has been Amen. a disclaimer. Thank you. Uh, that is a good call out. I mean, it is surprising for Hermione. I, I guess in the moment, she was just so excited, maybe, to get some proof that also, she tore it this, out. This creature, while it is X, 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 X rating, um, is in Fantastic Beasts. Everyone probably owns this book anyway. She didn't need to tear a page out of the <laughs> library book to carry it around. Doesn't she have a copy? It's a great, great point. So we do find out what the monster is, to your point, Eric. It is a basilisk. And this is the final piece of the puzzle, right? And on this note, it says, aside from its deadly and venomous fangs, the basilisk has a murderous stare, and all who are fixed with the beam of its eyes shall suffer instant death. Spiders flee before the basilisk, for it is their mortal enemy, and the basilisk flees only from the crowing of the rooster, which is fatal to it. And Hermione also notes at the bottom of the page how the monster has been getting around through the pipe Pipes. system. This doesn't always work for me, trying to picture these giant basilisk sized pipes just being slightly in the walls of Hogwarts, like ground level and above. It also doesn't work for me that if the basilisk is using the pipes, how is it seeing these people to petrify them or kill them? 
Like it, it's got to be in the corridors at some point, right? Like it, it truly has to be out in the corridors from the pipes are like how it gets up, but then it's around the corridors. Why? How has nobody seen this? It's just never made sense to me fully. I guess the only people who've seen it are the ones who are petrified. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It is an interesting question because we know the Chamber of Secrets was constructed before the school had plumbing. So how was the snake getting around back then? And when the school was retrofitted with pipes. Wouldn't somebody have found. Yeah. And and why are the pipes conveniently basilisk sized? Which are huge. I've never seen pipes that big. Yeah. I mean, are is does Hogwarts have a sewage problem where it needs these like massive pipes um, to move things around? Are they are they enchanted to kind of grow depending on you know, what's Ooh. passing through. <laughs> it's kind of gross. Actually, I yep. was grossed out reading this whole chapter because I was like, ew, like they're literally talked about how slimy the pipes were. They were sliding <sighs> through. And I was like, oh, God, it's disgusting. Yeah. I, I've always got the sense that the basilisk could sense the half bloods or the mud bloods. Yeah. It smells. It smells them. them. I think it mm-hmm. mentions smelling. Yeah. We end up with something that very rarely happens in a lot of the Harry Potter series. Uh, Harry and Ron decide that they're going to tell the adults what they know. Aww. Uh, so they sneak into the staff room. They hide in the closet. I, I don't know why they just didn't wait like normal people, like sit at the cow on the couch or whatever. But they, you know. Uh, and then during this whole process, they find out that Ginny has been taken into the Chamber of Secrets. And so... Even in that moment, they don't speak up. I assume probably Ron is too scared. Harry, probably the same. Um, But another thing that we see happen in this moment is uh, Lockhart be tasked with rescuing Ginny and defeating the monster. And I think this is just Lockhart's antics, his bravado, finally catching up with him. Now, I don't think the teachers are in any way genuine uh, in terms of (laughs) – I see you shaking your head, Kimberly, but I don't think they're genuine at all. Uh, They're just kind of putting it to him for having to put up with him for the entire year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so I was a little confused by the intentions here because it's they are encouraging him to go take care of the situation, but they don't actually believe he's going to be able to take care of it. So why send him? Yeah, sure, to get him out of the room, but it still seems a little – irresponsible to send him out well the plan is uh to send the students home they every teacher has given up at this point they all resign themselves to telling their houses that the students are going to leave on the hogwarts express the very next day so that's what it is is they're going to have a little bit of fun with lockhart because he's been annoying them all year (laughs) once he leaves mcgonagall's like right that's got him out from under our feet Um, But it's because they really don't have a plan. They're like, we're going to we're going to throw Lockhart out. We're just going to tell him, yeah, go do your thing. Wow. We're we're, we're so looking forward to you solving it. Yay. (laughs) But really, they're all just we're all leaving tomorrow. It's over. Hogwarts is closed. That was the impression I got as well. They're definitely just trying to get him out from underfoot. And my guess is they probably anticipate what he's going to try to do, which is flee. And that's exactly what he does attempt to do in any event until Harry and Ron thwart that plan. I agree. I I totally read it as them being sarcastic, but not necessarily a sarcastic tone, but it just wasn't real. It's how you treat a five-year-old when you're trying to get him out from (laughs) underfoot. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and, And, but I think probably the real issue that comes up here is that Harry and Ron leave the staff room with believing that Lockhart is is actually going to try and and do this. And so uh, that that was what kind of confused me a little bit is, you know, once they go back up to the common room and and they make the decision to um go and speak to Lockhart, why Lockhart of of all people, why would he be the one that you would go to as opposed to your head of house? Um but I think a lot of it had to do with what they saw in the staff room. Yeah, he's the defense against the dark arts teacher. He's the one that they're counting on. Like, God, if he was ever any good at all, he's (laughs) got to be the one. And he's not. But he, (laughs) this would be the one 
So they meet Lockhart in his office and Lockhart is looking to flee. And what I found interesting about this is that this continues a trend of defense against the dark arts professors not being what they appear. And we saw this in the first book with Quirrell and Voldemort being on the back of his head. We see it now with Lockhart being a fraud. And I think it really sets up well for Lupin in Prisoner of Azkaban being a werewolf. Um, and you know, we're obviously given clues to that throughout the book. But again, another professor not appearing to be who they actually are. There's also a really interesting line uh, that Lockhart has uh, when he's talking to Harry and Ron, when he says, books can be misleading. And I thought that this was a really interesting comment because this subplot point, I think, goes relatively unnoticed throughout, but it's another example of not trusting books. Mm -hmm. So all the books that Lockhart has written are fake, they're false. And yet we know that we've talked a lot about the diary and not you know, just jumping in and, mm. and engaging with books you know nothing about. So it's a good catch. Yeah. I mean, it, go ahead. There's also that line, you wrote them. It's an accusation. This is talking to me about journalistic integrity. Like you are responsible for the lies that you tell or the consequences that come as a result of that. Like there's no getting around this. Like Lockhart wants to say, oh, you were misled. Oh, oops. You got the wrong oopsie. You got the wrong impression. It's like, no, this this is on you, dude. Like you deliberately mismanaged this information and then also caused real life harm to all these people that you had ringed. Yeah, it boils down to unreliable narrators, right? And it's just such an interesting contrast to, say, a character like Hermione, who at this point in the series is putting a lot of stock into books in general which I would say overall is a good thing. But I think, you know, from the vantage point of being adults, we all know that just because something is printed in a book does not necessarily make it uh, sound or accurate. Um, and this is something Hermione learns over the course of the series. But, you know, with Riddle's Diary, with Lockhart, even with, you know, the Half-Blood Prince's Potions book, it, it does kind of boil down to this unreliable narrator theme. Information literacy is an important skill, evaluating resources. So I love that. Finding <laughs> primary sources, secondary sources. Yeah, it's all very important. Harry here also throws an Expelliarmus spell at Lockhart just as he was about to, just as Lockhart was about to hit Harry and Ron with a memory charm. And Harry has this good line, shouldn't have let Professor Snape teach us that one. Oh, snap. Ah, uh, yeah. Harry's <laughs> Loved got <it>. claws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's nice to uh finally learn a little bit about what larkhart is good at um from a ravenclaw perspective we know flitwick is the charms professor so i i guess like this is the the one thing we can point to I, there's not much that you can credit lockhart with but clearly he is a very gifted wizard when it comes to memory charms so now we finally go to Moaning Myrtle's bathroom and we're going to have a conversation with her. And one, one of the things that um, I think we have to give Harry credit for uh, is he's always this sympathetic character when it comes to those that are not viewed as equals or looked down upon because his treatment of her in this moment allows for him to get the information that he needs, which is finding out more about how she died and where the entrance to the chamber might be. Are you saying that Harry doesn't treat her right usually, but does now? Or No, no, no. I think generally he does. I'm saying we see that with a number of other creatures, characters throughout the course of the series. We see it with Dobby, right? Yeah. Early on in this book, um, you know, he, he doesn't look at them as being other yeah let's just say the malfoy family would look down upon dobby this reminds me of later when harry has to talk to helena ravenclaw uh aka the gray lady um it's much it, it's a similar conversation um but he handles it the same way which is just treat her like a person um a person who yes has died uh but then he gets to ask well 
how did you die? And it turns out that Myrtle is Myrtle's personality is such that she loves uh, talking about drama and tragedy, especially her own. Mm -hmm. Right. And it doesn't she even say nobody's ever asked me that question. I mean, yeah, like what? I think the first thing any teacher would do is ask her how she died. (laughs) Uh, So how'd you get here? Yeah, that's Um, especially because that more than anything would have led them to the Chamber of Secrets and finding it like very zero effort has been done to locate the chamber in the last 50 years since it was last confirmed open. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we also know that the school was looking for a convenient scapegoat and like a quick and easy solution. So somebody might have gone to Myrtle and asked for some very vague details, maybe, you know, less than what Harry is asking for here. And if she said anything about, oh, I saw big yellow eyes, I could definitely see um, someone at the time who's looking for a quick explanation saying, oh, yep, you know, big, big yellow eyes must be that acromantula that Hagrid had in here, even though that's not at all what that creature looks Mm. like. Mm -hmm. They're just assuming she's describing some sort of creature. There's only one creature that we know of that was here. Must be that one. Explains it. Checks the box. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, Because I was going to say, if you really were going to do an investigation, she would be the first person you would want to speak to, even in ghost form, to, to get the answers. And that would likely lead you to figuring out where the entrance to the chamber is. So it just seems like they didn't do their due diligence here. Uh, yeah. And there's, there's, it's implied that there were other attacks before Myrtle died. Um, I think it's what Aragog says that there had been attacks that students have been attacked, but the only two ways we know of a basilisk attacking somebody are by killing them or a petrification, which means they may have dealt with another string or another rash of petrifications 50 years ago. In which case, you would also want to ask those people, right when they wake up, right when they're restored, what did you see? Well, for the second consecutive book, we are going under the school. (laughs) Yeah. I love the line, I want to ring a bell every time it happens. We must be miles under the school. (laughs) And next book, we'll go under a tree. Oh, Yeah. So we must go underground uh, at least once uh, a book in the Harry Potter series. Yeah. So- we're beneath the school now, and Lockhart tries to get away from Harry and Ron, and he tries to oh, he steals Ron's wand, wrong wand to steal, and tries to obliviate the two of them, and it backfires. Yep, and it creates an explosion. Number one, which separates Harry from Ron and Lockhart, but it also completely erases Lockhart's memory to the point where he has no idea where he is or what's going on. Good thing Hogwarts doesn't offer replacement wines, am I right? (laughs) (laughs) Dude, they should have done that, though. I mean, the other chapter, Ron's wand is whistling in class. And that's why I brought it up, because uh, we've discussed that that is a problem, that they don't offer some complimentary replacement wines if a student needs it. But here, it actually did work out. So maybe it was all Dumbledore's plan once again. I mean, I know the explosion is meant to show how bad Ron's wand is, but I also tend to think that the uh, strength of the memory charm isn't necessarily overrated. I always kind of believe that this is the level of memory erasure Lockhart might have been going for for them. I always treat that as if it's like a one to one threat. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel really grateful that the wand that the spell just backfired. And the chapter wraps up uh, with Harry moving forward by himself, uh, much like we see in Sorcerer's Stone. Uh, after he leaves Hermione uh, to go face Quirrell Mort, he now leaves Ron behind uh, to go face Tom Riddle in the Chamber of Secrets. So uh, as I said at the top of the chapter, we, we're not there yet. We're right at the entrance. Uh, but uh, next uh, chapter, we will uh, we'll go inside and find out what's been uh, happening. A few odds and ends. Uh, one thing I wanted to call out was that it's noted um, when they're first you know, get out of the pipes that Ron steps on a rat skull and crushes it. If only it was his rat skull, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I was one I was actually wondering about that and we know that the author is is never 
you know, unintentional about things. Yeah, I'd give that a foreshadow alert. Of all the animals, you know, he steps on a rat skull. Right. And it's Ron. I'll give that a foreshadow alert. I also think that it is there to provide an explanation for how the basilisk has survived a thousand years, uh, that it's feeding on these tiny little creatures, which must not be a very satisfying meal. That's a good point. Yeah. Still, it is a rat's skull. So while there's definitely rats, whether or not Ron's is going to be a traitor. Yeah, I think it's some subtle foreshadowing. One thing I wanted to mention real quickly is that when they're going into the chamber and Harry is examining the sink. Myrtle says that that tap that he's looking at, the one with the strange little snake etched into the side of it, never worked. She says the faucet never worked. She's like, ooh, that never worked. Um, Isn't that a dead like giveaway that something is up with the faucet? Like, I think it would have made a lot more sense and it would be a lot more believable that many, many, many generations of teachers never found the opening of the Chamber of Secrets if the entrance where it was was actually behaving as it was ordinarily supposed to. But the idea that this tap never worked, even in Myrtle's time, shows it it just is a dead giveaway to me. Like, be smarter, be better. Like, what? This is a dead giveaway that something is amiss here. I also just, again, have questions about this plumbing setup. Was the Mm -hmm. air of Slytherin in the day that Hogwarts was, like, retrofitted with plumbing? Was that person a plumber? And they were like, okay, I'm going to come in here and structure this so that the basilisk has a way to get out into the castle. It it is very odd. Just thinking about the timing of things. Yeah, I think it makes sense. And I think we'll talk next week probably of like, how did Riddle first find the chamber? Because that's like a really exciting kind of Mm -hmm. question to, to ponder. But I think it makes sense that at least one other person has known about the chamber's entrance. And that's whoever put the plumbing in because they covered it up. And they didn't necessarily do a great job, but there there had to have been somebody at some point because it's not like Salazar Slytherin was like, where do I put my chamber? Oh, yeah, I know a girl's bathroom like he's not. It wasn't a girl's bathroom a thousand years ago. Um, So, yeah, somebody else kind of came along and and covered it up a bit. Some facilities manager not doing their job. (laughs) Slytherin (laughs) facilities manager is sympathetic to the cause and was like, I can cover this up. I thought it was interesting that it said that it was the worst day of Harry's life. Um, And then the timing of everything, it started with mid-morning where they were going up to see Hermione. And then they weren't going down to Lockhart's office until after dark. And I was like, well, what's going on all day? They're just sitting around the common room being sad. But where are the adults? Like, why weren't Arthur and Molly called? Like, why weren't the Weasleys sort of gathered together to... I assume mourn or talk or like they're just there's there's nothing they're just left in their common room all day yeah and it's noted that percy goes to send a letter to his parents so are they not notified by the school is it left up to the kids (laughs) to notify their parents that hey uh your only daughter is probably dead It's very and weird. Wh- and why why wasn't the ministry called in? Like where where's the the help of oh hey, we think we have an emergency. <laughs> They'll get there tomorrow. Like, you know, Arthur and Molly are there the next day. Um, but yeah, you're right. There is just some mysterious downtime where everyone's just in shock. They kind of could have predicted that this was gonna happen, but nobody was really expecting it. And then when it happens, there's just this loss of productivity. And we'll get to Most Valuable Chapter in a moment. But first, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best and not distracted by the latest security nightmares, you can do great things. But sometimes life, school, or work gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up in the way that you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to get out of the spiraling that's going on in your head and take on everything life throws at you. I love working with a therapist because it can help me manage anxiety, deal with issues in my everyday life, and help me be a more well-rounded person. A great therapist is like a marauder's map, helping you successfully navigate the path ahead. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. Plus, you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge, because sometimes it takes trying out a couple different therapists before you find the perfect match. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash MuggleCast today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash MuggleCast. And we have links to all of today's sponsors in the show notes. So now let's get to MVP, MVC, whatever you want to call it, of the week. Built Ford Tough. I'm going to give it to the Ford Anglia for saving Harry and Ron and saving Hagrid from extreme guilt and possibly another jail sentence. Because let's remember who led those kids into the forest. I'm going to give it to Ginny. Again, she held back the Dark Lord for this long. There's no way he would have waited till the end of the year to try and get all this stuff out. So she must have been delaying it for some in some way. I'm going to give it to Ron's wand for finally mm. doing something good. It's a good one. I'm going to give it to Snape for leading the uh, public shaming of Gilderoy Lockhart amongst the Hogwarts professors was a great moment. I loved when he was like, ah, just the man for the job. <laughs> Your moment you has are. come at last. <laughs> <laughs> I read that whole thing in Alan Rickman's voice, by the way, when I was reading this chapter, it was great. Um, So I had originally put the same thing Laura did. I must have missed that, but I have a backup one. Um, I want to give it to the faraway stranger for introducing an invasive species. Wow. You really like the chaos. I love it. <laughs> And hey, it's okay if there are duplicate uh, MVPs or MVCs of the week. No worries. Good to yeah. agree. We have a new bonus Muggle cast coming this week exclusively on our Patreon. Hogwarts Legacy has revealed characters with familiar names behind them, including a Weasley and a Black. Plus, there's been early previews of the game, and it shows that it can get violent, like shockingly violent. So we'll discuss that. We'll discuss casting. And more on today's bonus MuggleCast, again, available exclusively at patreon.com slash MuggleCast. We're doing two bonus MuggleCast installments a month now, so listen to more of our great content and help support the show. If you have any feedback about today's episode or the chapters ahead, and by the way, we're just going to do one chapter next week and then one chapter the following week because we're down to the last two chapters. You can send an owl to mugglecast.gmail.com, or you can use the contact form on mugglecast.com. You can also send a voice message. Just record it using the voice memo app on your phone and then email us that file. Or you can use our phone number, which is 192033Muggle. That's 192036844453. Now it's time for our weekly trivia game, Quizage. Last week's question. Who escorts the Gryffindors to their herbology lesson? The correct answer is Severus Snape. Congratulations to everyone who submitted the correct answer, including Ford Anglia Potter, Hufflepuffed Joseph, Tom Felton's quote, wand, Petrified Hermione still answering questions correctly, Callie Loves Quizich, Mittens, Half Bort Prince, and Count Cavatappi. Ah, yes. Okay, and here is next week's question. Who really opened the Chamber of Secrets 50 years ago? <laughs> this is one of the hardest questions we've ever done on Quizich. Wow. Um, submit your correct answers to us on the MuggleCast website, mugglecast.com slash Quizich, or click on Quizich from the main nav bar. Eric won't be here next week, and I think uh, he wanted to I drop that one in before it. he's not here this <laughs> I want, I want to give an easy question so there's no, you know, like nobody gets it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. It was the Fort Angley. I think that's the answer I'm submitting. That's right. Oh, yeah. Right. Wrong answers only. No, we're looking for the correct answer. Kimberly, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. We loved all of your contributions and thanks for supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for having me. This was fun. I yeah. thought it was going to be more nervous, more nerve wracking than it really was. Oh my gosh, oh, you, did you great. were great. Well, and to all of you out there, make sure you're following MuggleCast for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review if they allow you to and you like the show. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. We are MuggleCast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Thanks everybody for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. I'm Laura. And I'm Kimberly. Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all. Bye.